Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about the role of university museums with guests. David Brenneman, Director at Eskenazi Museum of Art at Indiana University. Amy Gilman, Director of the Chasen Museum of Art at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And David Little, Director and Chief Curator at the Mead Art Museum at Amherst College. So thank you all for joining us. It's been I've really been looking forward to discussing the role of university museums. We've known each other for a really long time. Let's talk about the role of university museums, starting off with you, David, at, because this, this idea of a university art museum is both consistent with the whole museum ecosystem, but it's also distinctive in its own way. What's your take on the world of, of university art museums as a particular part of this enormously interesting arts ecosystem. Yeah, so I began my, my museum career in academic art museums. And then, uh, and then I moved into a 20 year career in a standalone city art museum, the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, Georgia. And, um, and that was a fantastic experience. Um, the, 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 I'd say the, the differences between um, a standalone city art museum and a university art museum is that within the university, we're considered a, a nested institution. So, so the institution that I work for is Indiana University, um, and I direct the art museum, which is, which is an important part, but a, but a small part of a much larger organization. Um, and, and I think university art museums have a special charge, which is to um, to, to, to use their resources to, uh, for students, for the university community. And, um, but I would say that, that, that some of the similarities or maybe some of the growing similarities is that um, whereas university art museums might have been in the past able to be sort of inwardly turned research institutes, um, we are having to become much more outwardly facing both within our university communities and then the, the surrounding communities. And I would say that, uh, that, that for me, uh, one of the wonderful things about being in a university um, is that, that uh, there are ideas uh, everywhere. There are talented people uh, right next door. Um, I told people when I moved from Atlanta to Bloomington that my physical world got very small, but my intellectual world got huge. And I would say for me, that's one of the really amazing things about being, being here, being at a place like Indiana University. Well, the, the wonderful thing about this, this image, this idea of a gateway, right? You get this sense, and, and, and I hate to draw um, a, a, a really funny conclusion uh, or, or analogy, um, but you get this sense of, uh, you know, a place, um, but with windows and doors and, and walls blasted through and people sort of climbing in and, and, and disrupting and questioning and so on. Amy, I, I saw you smiling and nodding. And, and do, you, do you find that analogy of, of sort of this, this gateway into the community, but also being able to exploit that rich mm -hmm. um, intellectual work and diverse intellectual work of students and faculty and so on? Is, is that part of how you think of, of, of your museum? Um, it I, I was really chuckling because, um, as David uh, Brenneman actually knows, like I use this analogy to describe the Chazen all the time, in part because we are physically, we have two buildings that are connected by a bridge right. that actually is um, sort of uh, over and uh, like sort of hugs a, uh, a pedestrian mall that is the gateway, is one of the main gateways to campus, right? So literally we are at the edge of, we face both campus and community. And in our case, and I think this is true for our colleagues here, like we, there is no large civic encyclopedic um, art museum in Madison. So we actually also serve that function um, too. And there are other museums and even another um, art museum, but it's a contemporary focus. So when I got here and like, like David Brenneman, I had spent a lot of time in, in Toledo uh, at a big civic is, I actually came in with no expectations about what a university art museum was supposed to do because I had not actually come from that background previously. And that has been very freeing for me. I, I, like, I could just basically put quotes around David's statement about the intellectual um, sort of um, 
like fermenting that goes on at a huge u research university. It's, it's remarkable. I've never been in an environment quite like this where you need an expert. Somebody here is doing groundbreaking work on that, right? Um, it, whether in the arts or sciences or elsewhere. And that's incredibly exciting. And I think that even not thinking about COVID at the moment is like one of the most interesting challenges to me is like reimagining what this University Art Museum could be in the 21st century and really embracing the concept of being relevant to teaching and learning at a major research university. And, and, and that sort of comparison of your previous experience at, at, in Toledo, a fantastic museum with a fantastic collection. I mean, just right. really amazing. Right. But the context of an independent museum really is, is refer, it refers to its collection, particularly one as rich as, as the Toledo Museum of Art. And David, when, when you're looking at, at what you're doing at the Mead, you're not only referring to your collection, it's the same thing that, that Amy was, was talking about. You're not only referring to your collection, but you're thinking in, in very virtual terms because you have a faculty, you have students, not to suggest that university uh, students yeah. and faculty might be opinionated. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no. That's the, best, that's the best part though, is you get, um, you, this, you get a different kind of dynamism, a sort of sustained dynamism at a, a college because you have an audience. Um, now, granted at a civic museum, you have those regulars, but you really have an intense relationship with students over a four year period. And of course, with your faculty for as long as you're um, working with the, with the museum. Um, but uh, just to get back to the other points that were made, I think the other important thing just to underscore is the idea of, of depth. I was, uh, one of my first jobs was as director of academic programs at MoMA. And we worked with lots of great academic institutions and we would collaborate, but um, the kind of sustained depth and research that you get at a university and college museum is, is very different. And the involvement that you get both from faculty and, and it's so important to, to underscore too, the role of students, that students themselves, I mean, these incredibly bright young people who are bringing uh, great ideas to the museum and to the university and colleges. Uh, you know, we really uh, utilize them and learn from them um, through this process. And just the way uh, we were talking a little bit about collection, the way that you think about your collections are, are very, very different. You know, for instance, at the Mead, we're a rather, you know, small uh, space in terms of like roughly around 4,000 square feet. So if I look at my walls, I can show maybe 250 to 300 works, but about 1,800 or 2,000 works are studied every year. So most of our collection is actually used not in the galleries, but in the, in the study spaces. And then the other thing I would say, both at the university uh, level and college is the idea of collaboration. At the Mead, um, we have a very, I have a very close relationship with our uh, Russian center. We have one of the nicest, one of the best Russian collections because of an alum. So we're working together collaboratively on an intellectual level, but also with the art. And then with the five colleges as well um, and the collaborations that, that happen there. And again, those happen in other civic museums, but there's a kind of uh, close knit uh, community that is uh, a little bit more intense, I find, uh, with these college relationships. You know, you're making a, a wonderful point because when we look at, at the dialogue that is progressing within society, um, there is sometimes a separation between the dialogue in society and museums where controversy isn't necessarily something that, that you want to embrace because it might suppress visit, visitation. Whereas controversy is the lifeblood of a, an academic institution. Mm -hmm. You have academics who disagree. You have students who disagree. You have new ideas uh, filtering in. Um, are you finding, Amy, that your collection and, and your museum spaces are also used in an academic study way by artists? We also have studio artists, mm -hmm. right, who are coming in to study works. Mm -hmm. um, are you finding that, that, that like, like David Little, that um, you have this non-exhibition set of programmings and not non-education in terms of art historical set of, mm -hmm. set of activities, but real 
grappling with works that are happening by, by students who are studying in a way that, that doesn't necessarily happen at an independent museum. Sure, I, I, um, I think that, so when I got here, um, our engagement with the faculty and uh, teaching and learning was, was, I think, fairly typical of many university art museums. And as, as Dave was describing, like great relationships with individual faculty, a lot of bespoke learning, right? Like they reach out and they say, we'd love to be able to do a print study room, a visit around, you know, Slavic history at this point and look at prints, right? I mean, like whatever you're talking about. Now, I will tell you about a little experiment we've done this summer that uh, was, um, it was kind of in the works prior to COVID, but then it really accelerated this summer, which was that we made the decision that uh, in about May, that we were going to just like double down on, um, on creating a set of curriculum in, in modules that faculty could access that is about the collection. And it's thematic based. It's not about art history. It's actually tied to what we have on UW campus. I think this is common at many large universities, a big read, right? Like a collective reading every year. It's called the Go Big Read at UW. And in our case this year, it's, it's called Parkland. So it's about the, the Parkland um, movement and the movement um, about, um, uh, of the survivors of the shooting at Parkland High School. Um, and and that doesn't have like a, a clear relationship to the, the museum's collection, but we chose themes around art and activism and trauma and resilience, which also feel very, very present today, right? Not just related to Parkland. And then we've done this like little curriculum modules that, uh, faculty can pull into their uh, courses um, irrespective, you know, and, and adapt them and change them and do whatever. And it's related to our collection, right? We've like identified core groups of works. And in that way, we're trying this experiment where we know that more faculty will use it. They are dying for really good online <laughs> um, content, right? That will be engaging. But we also think this is going to have a much longer tail post COVID, right, where we can like start producing curriculum that faculty can access in different ways, in addition to the kind of bespoke um, things that we have done on a, on a really regular basis and will obviously continue. And David I think Amy makes a Mark, I think Amy makes a really great point in that model. And I think we often think about the faculty uh, bringing ideas to the museum, mm -hmm. but um, the museum can bring ideas to the faculty and the in the community and the curriculum. And you see that uh, through special knowledge that um, members of, of one staff has. And so that's been, that dynamic I think is really, really important um, in, in terms of enriching the, the curriculum and enriching colleges and universities. One of the hopeful signs is that in, in response to the, uh, to the poll, and incidentally, uh, please attendees, uh, you can ask questions on the Q&A function and we'll try and deal with them uh, in real time. But we just had uh, a poll completed in which 45% uh, of respondents said that they had visited uh, uh, museums in the, in, during the pandemic. Yay! <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, when you, when you look at, for example, the performing arts, uh, that number is way, way down. Um, and museums, because of their dynamic, you can socially distance, you can do it, you can do it uh, more safely um, and, and carefully. Uh, you have a, you have a semi-controlled environment. Uh, David Brenneman, are you finding that your museum is receiving uh, visitation and, and that it's enlivened by interactions with audiences and students and so on, or are you more or less shut down? Well, I would say that, that, that one of the words that, um, came into common usage and that's gonna be, I think a standard word is, is the word hybrid. Um, and, it, and that means um, at, at, at Indiana University and, and probably other colleges and universities, it means a, a blend of in-person teaching and, and online or virtual learning. And so we uh, were able to, to pivot pretty quickly uh, to that, that new uh, model or that new structure and so I would say, so the, our museum is opened. We opened at the end of um, August, just around the time that students came back to, to Bloomington. And um, we'd had to put in COVID restrictions in terms of 
um, numbers of people who could be in the building. Um, everybody had to be masked. So we had to put security in certain places so that they could check people and talk with them when they came into the building. Um, we have maximum numbers of people in our gallery. So I would say people are coming back to the museum. Um, and I think that, that uh, it's really the, the things that I've heard is that, that, that there are new students who are exploring the museum. Mm -hmm. And then members of our community are also just see it as a really wonderful amenity. Um, and so yes, people are coming to our museum, they're enjoying. Um, but we've also really taken the opportunity, I suppose, of the pandemic to, to invest a lot more time and energy and thinking in our virtual engagement mm -hmm. uh, work. And so that's been um, something that, that, that we've been, um, you know, again, that we see as part of the, the future, uh, not only of our museum, but I think museums in general. I just love, love, love that point that you made about being a hybrid institution. Could you, could, could, could you all talk, uh, David, maybe, maybe we start with you. How do you feel about this idea of hybrid institutions where we're no longer pure one thing or the other, uh, but, but we're exploring um, models that might break some, some rules from the past? Yeah, I think, I think all of us are, are experiencing that. I mean, the funny thing, Mark, is that we've always been hybrid institutions, um, but maybe haven't given the attention to our websites and to our digital programs that we're being asked to do uh, now. And I agree that that will always be uh, part of, of what we need to do is to create. I mean, many of us have a much higher attendance uh, coming to our website than ever come to our museum. Um, I still think though that at the end, even within this hybrid model, that there'll be this incredible lure to come and experience the work firsthand. And I, I had my preparator who was, had a great, great point about some of the hybrid classes. I, I asked him, I said, how is everything going with the hybrid classes and how are the students doing? He said, the remote students have this sense of community because they see the other students in the museum. So it's a really interesting oh, connection wow. between the outside and the, and the inside. And I would have never thought of something like that, uh, such a wonderful observation that they could imagine themselves in the museum and experiencing the work firsthand. But the hybrid is, is certainly, and I'm so excited. We're, we're really at the horse and buggy stage, I think of uh, utilizing the digital. I and mean, I think we've all done these wonderful virtual tours, but um, we've got a lot lot to work and it's just a matter of uh, a lot of work to do it's a matter of you know also creating content that can be have a long life as amy had mentioned and really i really think the next level um for the digital now is we really need to think about digital curators um uh in 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 the future and really start to invest in that i couldn't agree more in in our work um, one of the things that we've been trying to get across is within this idea of hybrid programming um, is actually the solution to issues like the racial disparities that exist within, uh, within museums, right? Um, uh, we just recruited uh, Patrick Sims actually from the University of Wisconsin to be the provost over. Oh, the Patrick, I love Patrick. Isn't he great? Oh, I was so sorry to see him go, man. I mean, great hire, great hire. Well done, well done. Yeah, but well, <laughs> well, the interesting thing here is that Patrick's sensibility is very hybridized. There's nothing pure, right? And the reason why that's important is that if you look at purity, purity results in the constant repetition of, the, of past definitions. And so you have embedded within that approach some real confirmation bias. Um, Amy, when you're looking at, at, at your work and interacting with the uh, community, how are you driving change? How are you adapting to the dialogue that, that is unfolding across America in a way that allows these views, whether it's um, views on, on race, views on the, ec uh, the economy, views on our international place in the world, our values. How do you bring that into your environment so that you're not suppressing a viewpoint, but you're, you're allowing for exploration of diverse audiences and diverse sensibilities within your space? So, I mean, I'll, can I, I'll, I'll just say, I, I wanna talk about just briefly about like, why being part of a big research institution is is like been very appealing to me and because 
of something that you're talking about, which is that we can explore things. And in fact, I think it is incumbent on university art museums to do research. And usually, historically, that has actually been about researching objects in the collection and doing whatever. But what I'm talking about is actually doing research about what it means to be a museum, right? Because well, as you point out, we have some flexibility that um, uh, maybe other models do not have in this way. So, you know, um, pre-pandemic, the most press that we received since I had gotten to the museum in, in fall 2017 was in the fall of 2019, when we like radically opened the museum 12 hours a day, seven days a week, because we decided that we, we actually don't know when people really want to come to museums. We think we know because so whatever, some museum gods came down in the 40s and said, you shouldn't be open on Mondays and you should close at five o'clock and like what, yeah, whatever, right? And at a big civic museum, it's really hard to change that dynamic because every hour is very expensive, right, to do. So one of the things that we were thinking about and you know now post COVID, I'm like, oh yeah, doubling down on like being the most open art museum in the country sounds maybe not like the best decision, but underneath it was this concept that we should we should pilot something, and then study it and get feedback about it and learn from it and then push it into the field, right? So that other museums can pick up on what we've learned. And maybe that becomes something that, you know, a big civic could then take to a donor and say, you know, what, what we've learned is that people really do, like, it would be better for us to be open from 12 to 8 every day, even if you're still closed on Mondays, because people really do want to come after work, right? And not just on Thursdays or Fridays. And I think that, you know, getting back to what you were just really asking about, it's like, it is actually incumbent on us to set up situations where we can experiment and experiment with things that are challenging and things that, that are difficult and all of that, because actually we are nested within institutions that are grounded in that, on that, that mission. You know, uh, we just completed another poll and we asked uh, what university art museums do better than independent art museums. And, and, and the answer that received the most votes, uh, almost 70%, is the university art museums are better at combining disparate elements with visual arts, mathematics, other art forms, lectures, plays, and so on and so forth. And, and uh, then we also got um, that uh, university art museums are better at stating exhibitions on controversial issues like racism, climate change, uh, policing and so on. And then th that was about 58%. And the, the, the third answer that uh, garnered a lot of support is that, that, that university art museums are better at innovating in ways that challenge conventional thinking, which goes to points that all three of you made. And I got a question from um, Ricardo Reyes at uh, the University of Hartford about how you engage various disciplines across campus David Brenneman, do you want to take that in terms of, of how you take yeah. people who don't necessarily come into the museum every day? Yeah. Um, how do you deal with that? Well, I think it's a challenge. I mean, I think that, that uh, you know, again, as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the, the way that, that, that university art museums were, were managed, uh, the expectations that they set of themselves and that were set upon them was really to be kind of quiet, kind of inward, inwardly turned um, uh, research institutions. And, um, and, that's, and that's changing and it's changing by necessity and it's changing by desire. And, uh, but I don't think that the uni university, at least this is true of Indiana University, uh, is really structured in a way that, that naturally fosters uh, exchange and dialogue and information sharing. It's something that you really have to invest some significant time and energy uh, to make happen. And, um, and I do think the opportunity for, for art museums on university campuses is that um, we are, there are, I guess I call it a leadership opportunity. And it's a leadership opportunity that art museums are, I think, particularly well um, equipped to, to, to take on. Um, and so I think we have to, to think about strengthening um, and discovering new partnerships, uh, strengthening old partnerships, discovering new partnerships on campus, and really taking the time and, and energy and investing uh, in, those, in those partnerships, which um, 
you know, I don't think they'll be successful if they're one-offs. They need to be ongoing. And, 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 and our colleagues across the university need to feel that, 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 that it's a true partnership. Um, so so we're, it, we're in the process of, of, of doing some strategic planning and, and partnerships, particularly on campus, are, are an area uh, where, where we're uh, going to be investing a, a lot more time and energy. Yeah, I would say just as a follow up on David's uh, remarks is I, I think the um, those relationships and partnerships are so critical and recruiting figuring out ways to recruit young faculty we find in particular. Um, and we we host um, events in the fall and the spring to sort of help help introduce them to how to teach with the museum. And the same thing with with young uh, students as well. But I want to Mark, I want to return really quickly to your uh, comments about the the political um, in the in the museum, and then also my, um, Amy's comment about um, the museum as a model. Uh, the academic museum, and I, I think that that's where where we can really separate ourselves um, is to to model um, activities. I mean, we don't. I haven't had a single person. I've been at the Mead for five years. I haven't had a single person call me and ask me what the attendance is at the Mead. Um, it's not. Uh, I'm not watching the attendance. We're free. Um, until Amy stole our fire, we used to be open the most hours uh, a year. Where where we were, we are open during uh, non-COVID twelve. I mean nine to twelve at night. But Amy, you beat us. So, um, but we're gonna. Oh, I like the nine to twelve at night. That's good. <laughs> we're gonna <laughs> catch up to you. But what I wanted to get to is that the political life I found was. It's not to say it was easy, but it's easier. Um, we have, you know, we've collected about 70% um, artists of color in the last five years and done uh, political shows, but I, we're really at a new stage right now uh, as a result of the George Floyd. And that's where I think that um, museums can model themselves. And that's about the process. It's about the structural racism within our institutions, uh, you know, both the institutions that we're part of and our own museums and how we can look at um, kind of the structural processes of, of how we do things. You know, and that includes recruiting. Uh, we are at the Mead working on, you know, we're rewriting our job descriptions, looking at even the way that we signal the types of programs that we're gonna do, our teaching goals, um, our mission statement, I'm rewriting with the board. But you know, it, when you start to really look at this work, and it's hard, and, and also our own self-learning, um, you know, it's a really hard process. But I really think that that is the most uh, political thing that we can we can do as uh, college and academic museums, and really model um, behaviors and goals for uh, larger civic museums, because we we do have a kind of support system that um, there really is no excuse for us not to be doing this. Some of your points feed into a question that was posed by uh, Stephen Miller um, about uh, collecting uh, policies and accessioning, deaccessioning. I think what you're saying in, in, in that part of your point, uh, David, is that our collections were previously, they, they dealt in a wedge here of, of the entire world of art. And a lot of that was informed by the founding of these institutions, which were formed by white Europeans. And then now, it isn't that that wedge is bad. It's that that wedge is completely insufficient. And we didn't know it, right? We, we in America, the people who were in power were focused on their lives, right? Now we have to expand. We have to expand until we have the full circle of America. And for the first time in this nation's history, we have to think in ways that go beyond our own sensibility. Amy, when you're looking at how you're shaping the collections, that's a complicated thing, right? You can't collect infinitely. You have to deaccession. You have to touch that third rail. You have to make intelligent decisions. How are you approaching it? How, how in a university environment do you actually get to a point of action and not just debate? and hand-wringing? How do you get to the point where you can actually change your collection in ways that take into account some of the points that David was making? Sure, I, I think that, you know, David's comment is is so perfect about, you know, like, he, 
you know, what when when David is talking about um, you know how what percentage of um, people of color uh, artists of color has been acquired by the museum like that is a choice that is a choice that is that is not just something that like happened in the world right mm -hmm. that is a choice that David has made as a leader as part of this time and that is where I, I really feel like we come down to as as leaders within our institutions within the field is um really making very deliberate choices about what is a priority for us. And, you know, I, I, I think it's this false uh, discussion that people get into about like, you know, you're gonna sacrifice this discussion about quality and whatever, but, you know, diversity is excellence, right? And we actually will not have an excellent collection until we are more and more comprehensively diverse, right? right? I mean, you know, studies have shown this about diverse workplaces, about all of this stuff, and I believe that about the collection. And that means that you are making choices about what it is that you're doing with your limited funds to be able to do that. And around deaccessioning, I mean, um, I think that we really, you know, deaccessioning is a part of the, muse of like managing a collection appropriately. Right. But you really do, it is not something to be done um, uh, quickly, and it is not something to be done um, uh, in order to satisfy the need of a moment, right? That is why those original rules, right, have been there for so long about like that you deaccession and in order to be able to feed the collection, is that it should not take a short amount of time to deaccession something, right? It should be a process. There should be things that you're ticking off. There should be experts that you're talking to, all of those things. And you should be able to point to that as part of the process. And I, I do believe that that is, that is an important part of shaping the collection, um, but it is not a short-term uh, uh, process to undergo. David, I'm going to give you the last word. David Brenneman, I'm going to give you the last word because we're coming to the end of our time and I see you're about jumping out of <laughs> Uh, go ahead. Well, I, I just wanted to kind of follow on uh, to, to the things that both uh, Amy and David have said. I mean, one of the things that's amazing about IU is the incredible amount of material culture here. And I think there was a, a census recently, um, there's over 250 collections at IU. And there's probably in the range of millions of objects at at Indiana University. And it's a kind of a wunderkammer of, of, <laughs> of, you know, you name it, we got it. And, and a question though, I would say in this, this virtual age, this digital age is, what is the point of having things? What is the point of having material objects? It's a very basic question, but no one has really asked it in, in, a, in a comprehensive, in a deep, in, a, in an idea driven way. And I think, you know, before you begin talking about deaccessioning, uh, which, which, you know, I've uh, done and been involved in in, in my career, um, I think you have to talk about what is it that you want and what is it that, that your collections, that your material collections mean to you and your institution and its research mission. And I think, again, that's a those are kinds of questions that when I arrived at IU, I would have thought, well, people thought about that and there are answers to that. And there aren't because no one's thought about it because frankly, in some ways it's so huge, you know? Um, and, and then also, you know, kind of touching on what Amy was just saying, you know, our collections are incredibly diverse to the extent that we have works of art from just about every art producing culture in the history of mankind. Um, but, 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 but no one knows that. And, um, and, and I see the real challenge for us is, is connecting those, those works of art uh, with people, with human beings, with, with uh, uh, folks that, 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 uh, that could you know, connect with those things and find meaning in those things. Um, but, but we haven't really been very good at, at making those and finding those connections. I um, think that's such an important point. What you're saying, what you're all saying, is that if we're going to solve the problem of museums being too much of a monoculture, being too European um, art oriented and having curators and staff and so on who uh, come from, from largely, not exclusively, but largely from that tradition, we have to think differently about art and culture. We have to think differently about intersectionality because in, in cultures that are non 
European, you have this different sensibility and people are interested. They have educated themselves. They have developed this, this idea of what art is that has been traditionally left outside of these institutions. Now we have to throw open the doors. It's David Little, your, your idea of this gateway. Uh, Amy, the idea of a gateway, David Renneman, this idea of a gateway, we're throwing open the doors, we're welping, welcoming those new ideas and with that new curators, right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. It's so great to talk with, with friends where, where we've had these conversations and bring them out into the open. I do apologize, attendees, we have uh, quite a few questions that we're not able to, to uh, deal with in our short time. David Little of The Mead, uh, Amy Gilpin of Chazen and uh, David Brenneman of Eskenazi. Thank you so much for sharing your work. That's the nonprofit report. Attendees, thank you for your questions. Everybody stay safe, everybody mask up, and we'll see you next Tuesday.